So as we continue our um, our walk through Genesis, we've taken a lot of time uh, in the first couple of chapters, and uh, we have reread Genesis one, two, and three. Hopefully, in a better way uh, that is more helpful, that has solved some problems. That has helped you maybe even to answer some questions in your own life, but also to answer questions that you get from, from others. And so now we're in this so what series. So, so what is the point of all of this? And um, I hope that we've been able to kind of show through reading Noah and then the uh, Tower of Babel and then into Abraham's life, how reading Genesis and focusing on things like God's order Genesis 1 creation account is more about God ordering the cosmos for his purposes than it is about scientific creation. Genesis 1, in my opinion, is not an account of chemical substance. It's not what things are made of. It's why things are made and who is doing it. And that is God. He is the agent. He is the creator. That we see the seventh day as the point of creation. There is no such thing as six days of creation. Six days of creation means that you missed the point of all of creation. Go back to Genesis 1-1 and start again and read it again. And read it again and read it again until you understand that creation is about the seventh day. Because what happens on the seventh day? Rest. The king has ordered his sacred space and he takes his throne on the seventh day Genesis 1 is less a scientific lab report and is more a coronation story how God the creator of the heavens and the earth Avinu Shabbat our father in heaven has ordained and sanctified the creation to be his sacred place and on the seventh day he is seated as the king of of that space that's what creation is about that's what the seventh day is about we talked about Genesis 2 and probably the, the, the Genesis 2 and 3 probably the two chapters of uh, created the most consternation um, we talked about Adam uh, maybe it not being an account of, of uh, Adam's physical creation that Adam is not actually dust just like none of us are actually dust. We were all born of women, and yet we are dust because we are mortal. And the possibility that Adam could have been mortal as well, pre-fall. Pre, uh, we talked about how Adam could potentially have been, Adam and Eve could have potentially been the part of a, an existing humanity at his time. And the, the, what the story is trying to tell us is that Adam was called out of humanity to be God's representative on God's holy mountain where there was a garden, a sacred garden. We established some of these things. We established the serpent in chapter 3. Whether we believe he's the devil, Satan, Lucifer, a man, a whatever, some kind of angelic being, whatever, however you think about that, or however we want to think about that. The point of Genesis 3 is that there are two trees in the garden that are of utmost importance. One is the Etz Chaim, the tree of life, that represents the presence of God and wisdom and how to stay in the presence of God and reflect the presence of God. And the Etz Da'at, the tree of knowledge, and the tree of knowledge is me taking the authority to be a little God in my own right and to make my own decisions and for me to decide what's right and what's wrong rather than submitting to the wisdom of God. And every day, every one of us faces a series of those choices. We learned about the serpent and that there's an adversary. There's always going to be an adversary. Live 15 minutes they'll be adversary we talked about chapter 4 where Cain and his brother Abel find themselves where? in the field 
What is the field? The field is where the wild things are. It's outside of God's temple, cosmic temple mountain. It's outside of the sacred space of God where God has ordered things to be the way that he wants them to be. It's outside of there where Adam and Hava were supposed to take sacred space and continue the ordering process. And yet they didn't. They failed to do that. And so Cain and Abel find himself out, themselves out in the field where the first murder in Scripture takes place, where there is no law, where there is no sacredness. We talked about Noah. Noah was a man like Adam. He was the next seed that Eve was promised. He was the seed that God called out of humanity, right? And told him to do something with a tree. And what was that? Build an ark. Build a teva, an ark out of etz gopher. Gopher tree. And that Adam in his obedience, I'm sorry, Noah in his obedience would be the one that would be responsible for reversing the orur, the curse So Noah, in his tree boat, ends up through chaotic waters, Genesis 1, 1 and 2, ends up where? On a mountain. That's why I love the Bible. He ends up on a mountain, and the very tree that his boat was made from because tree, as we said, but I'm trying to catch everybody up. It's a lot to catch up on. Uh, tree in Hebrew is etz. Etz, right? It means a living tree. It also means a tree that's been cut down. It also means when you take something and make it out of a tree, boards, it's still etz. Etz, etz, etz. It's all etz. He ends up with a tree on a mountain just like Adam and Eve left and were exiled from in the garden. What is the name of the mountain? Arurat. Arurat reverses the curse, the Arur. So we see Genesis happening all over again. Cosmic waters, trees, mountaintops, all altars being sacrificed, all these things happening all over again. We talked about the Tower of Babel. Which direction is exile always in biblical literature? To the east. Anytime you see a people group in the Bible moving east, they're going into exile. It's the Bible's way of saying they're, being, they're moving away from the presence of God, from the plan of God, from the sacred space of God. Now, that does not mean today that if you leave Louisiana and move to South Carolina, you're going into exile. That's not what it means we got, we got to remember what we're dealing with. We're dealing with biblical design patterns and themes. We're not dealing with, with, with one-to-one set in stone. Don't start making doctrine over, over this. Because one day we may all be in the land, which for us is to the east. <laughs> but in the biblical literature, going east is going into exile. And so we see these people moving Adam and Eve were sent to the east, east, Tower of Babel. They moved to the east, and they find a what? A place called Shinar, but it's a what? A plain, right? It's a plain. People in the ancient times don't worship on plains. They worship on what? Mountains. So what do you do if you're in a plain and there's no mountain? You build one. And so they built a ziggurat. A tower, most translations call it, reaching to the heavens. What is the purpose of building a ziggurat? So the gods come down. And lo and behold, what happens in the Tower of Babel? God came down and said, let's go see what's going on. <laughs> Accomplished its purpose. We talked about how the main problem with the Tower of Babel, what is the big deal? Why was God so upset? Why this scattering and this confusion and all these things? There was the two main problems with the Tower of Babel is that number one, God called his people to be mobile. 
Adam and Eve's job was not to leave the garden, but to carry the garden with them as they moved throughout the earth, continuing the ordering process, the creation process that God began in Genesis 1. And yet, what did the people in the Tower of Babel do? They settled and they built a city. The second thing that Adam and Hava were to be were to do, what Noah was to do as well, was to be the image of God. Before sin came and wrecked us, before the idea that, that we could be separated from God because of the way we acted and the way we thought, before that was a thing, God said who we are as human beings, and that is His image. Some of you need to reflect on Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Excuse me, that section. You need to write it on your mirror, your bathroom mirror on a sticky note or a legal sheet or whatever catches your attention, and you need to read it every day. We blame the world for a bad self-image a lot of times. Well, the world says you're, you know, your hair has to look like this and your, your teeth have to look like this and you have to dress like this and you have to be this weight and you have to be this, that, and blah, blah, blah. And so we blame the world for a bad self-image in most people. You know what I believe is the cause, root cause of a bad self-image for most people? The church. The church. Because what has the church said? Oh, you're a worthless piece of nothing. Okay. So you need Jesus. Great. Where do I sign up? We well, come to the front of the church. And in some churches, you actually sign up. <laughs> For all you Southern Baptists out there. Great. You got Jesus. Now what? Well, you're still kind of a worthless piece of crap. And kind of nothing. So, uh, okay. Okay. Because all of your righteousness, all of it, is as filthy rags. Man, we love to preach that, that verse way out of context. Why do preachers get so happy telling people that every good thing you try to do is like, is like a bloody menstruation rag in front of God? Because that's exactly what the text says it is. Filthy rags is exactly that. Not like you're wallowing out in the mud. Why do we love, to, why do we love to, to burden people with that? When it's out of context, read the whole chapter. So I got Jesus, but I'm still worth nothing. Oh, and then they tell us, by the way, the responsibility for spreading the gospel and the message of God is on your shoulders. Good luck. Bad self-image. We talked last week about how uh, last week was so good for me. I'm, I'm, I hope it was good for everybody else. It was good for me. Even if it wasn't good for anybody else, it doesn't matter. It's a good one in my book. We talked about the idea that God's will is not a razor's edge kind of thing. I don't know how many people have lived in fear their entire lives wanting to do the will of God but yet never being able to really feel like they're in the will of God because they've been taught by one way or another that well if you do the good or the right thing but it's at the wrong time you're outside of the will of God if you do the right thing at the right time with the wrong motive then, you're, then the, God's not going to bless it all these crazy, wacky, toxic doctrines we've been taught there's a lot of room inside the will of God inside the covenant inside we're children we're children Baruch Hashem and so we come up we run slap up against this man named Avram just all of a sudden he pops up and so I meant to cover Avram in about two lessons it's probably going to end up being more than that um, just because every time I go to move on I got to go back and catch something that I missed the last time and so we left off in the story of Bavel 
with a people building a city and making a name for themselves. That's where the story of Babel ends, pre-dispersion and confusion. That's what sets God off. They chose to fortify themselves, protect themselves, sustain themselves, and to make a name for themselves. We find this man named Avraham. We talked about Avraham in the end of chapter 11 being faced with a brother who dies and there's these two sisters but three sisters. So is it two or is it three? And we talked about how Sarai is from a traditional understanding this sister named Iska. And that very likely, Avraham knew when he took Sarai to be his wife. Avraham is the firstborn. He gets to pick. He gets to pick which niece he marries. And I know that's weird, and I know it makes us uncomfortable, and I know we don't like thinking about that. But in this culture, if your brother dies and leaves children, it is your responsibility as the oldest to preserve his reputation, his lineage, his name. So Abraham does what righteous men do. He chooses the barren woman, knowing she's barren. Why is this why does the story take a massive turn here? Why is Abraham the father of faith? Because we just left Babel, where everybody was worried about making a name for themselves. And we come upon this righteous man named Avram who is an idolater when we meet him. And yet even in his idolatry, what is he doing? He's caring about the name of someone else over himself. It's no consequence. It's not just a chronological history that these stories are put next to each other. The thread that unites them is whose name are you living for? And Avram, in his idolatry and in his, in his paganness, God finds a man and he says, I can work with a man like that. And so just like Adam Rishon, the first Adam, Avram gets pulled out of where he is and he's told to go which direction? Westward. To where? The new Eden, Canaan, the promised land. Avram is taking us back to the garden. So here's a question. What is, somebody define for me Torah. What is Torah? Instructions. I'm glad nobody said commandments. Because while Torah includes commandments, Torah is not simply commandments. We do ourselves a disservice in the Hebrew Roots Messianic Torah Pursuant Movement when we focus on commandment keeping. Oh, what do you bet? What are you saying? Isn't commandment keeping important? Absolutely. But let's not miss the forest for the trees. Let's not be so belligerent and militant about a way of walking the commandments that we miss the entire rest of the story. See, Torah is not only the end of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy where there's commandments given. Torah is also Bereshit, also Genesis. Why? Because it's not just commandments that teach us to walk in the wisdom of God. It's the history. It's the narrative. It's the poetry. It's the experience of the patriarchs and the people around them that teach us how to walk in the wisdom of God. So it's, it's more than just the first five books. Indeed, it's all of Scripture. But it's more than just the commandments itself, themselves. It's a question about who is God and who are we. What are we told about God in the beginning of the story? He loves creation. He is obsessed with creation. That includes you and I. He loves creation. And God is not out to destroy creation. 
We did it with Noah. Only if you don't understand temple typology in that the earth was wicked and the ground was cursed because of bloodshed. So there's a cleansing that had to happen. Because God can't dwell in his sacred space if it's defiled by bloodshed. And so there's a cleansing that's happening with Noah's flood. It's not about God wanting to destroy the earth. He remorsed over having to do this. He's, his intention is not to destroy creation, but to redeem it, to save it, to restore it. That's God's intention. And the crazy thing is that he invites us to be his partners, made in his image to join him in that process. Don't believe me? Read Genesis 1 and 2 again, and then read Revelation 20 and 21. Same story. Which tells us what? In between those two bookends, the thread is heading away from that garden, and then a turning point we find with Avram, where we're heading back towards that garden. But in order to be God's partners... In this mission, we need to act and think like him. In his wisdom, we need to be his image. But in our God-likeness, not our sin-sick, oh, sinner saved by grace. Stop it. Every, listen, everybody knows we got sin to deal with. Everybody knows. You got your thing, you got your thing, you got your thing, I got my things. We all got our stuff. We get it. We're not, we're not putting down the idea or doing away with the idea of sin. What I'm saying is that in the church, we've worshipped sin. Oh, well, that's preposterous. Really? What do we preach about? What do we talk about? What do we pray about? Sin, struggle, deliverance, challenge. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying what are we focused on? Just like in the same way many people worship Satan without even realizing it because that's who they're always talking about. How about talking about God and that sucks the oxygen out of that adversarial force in your life? To be in our, in our image-bearing capacity, we have to know when to stop and when to trust. We have to know when to trust. What do I mean by we have to know when to stop? In Genesis 1, the creator, did he make everything on earth perfectly fine and wonderful and all good? Maybe the way we've been taught it, that's the way it was understood. There's a problem with that. He gives Adam and Eve a job to do what? Go into the earth, tend the garden, and then go into the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Why is there a need for Adam and Eve to subdue something that God already subdued? God created a place where things were as he wanted them. And then he put representatives in that place and taught them and then expected them to go out and expand that space in the rest of the earth. God knew when to stop creating. He knew on the sixth day when everything was done to his liking, he knew when to stop. And then he called on some partners to continue that process. God also knows when to stop destroying. Because in the flood narrative, he doesn't destroy every single person and all, he doesn't wrap the earth in destruction. He saves a family, he saves a segment of creation. He knows when to stop creating and he knows when to stop destroying. As his image, do we know the same? Do we know on day six, at the end of day six, it's time for me to stop creating? I've done all I can for this week. It's time for me to stop and let my pro productivity rest, let myself rest. Do we know when to stop creating? Do we know when enough is enough? Do you know with your own children, when you've done the absolute best you can, when to say enough is enough? It's easy for me to ask that question because I'm not there yet. I got a couple years. But God knows when to stop destroying as well. Did he, do we, do we know when to stop? Do we know when to stop 
fixing, cleansing. Boys, do we know when to stop? Or do we beat a dead horse over and over and over? Do you know with your family and friends when to stop talking about keeping the commandments? Do you know with your spouse or with your, your loved ones, do you know when to stop harping about Easter and Christmas? Do we know when to stop? We talked last week, kind of left off with the idea that maybe out there for some of you, it is for me, it's uncomfortable for me. The idea that God's ideal I don't believe, and this is new for me, so forgive me if I'm <laughs> clumsy communicating it. God's ideal may not be to say, okay, Casey, I want you up at 545. I want you to put on white socks, red tennis shoes, this pair of jeans. I want you to eat this for breakfast. God's intention is apart from what some of us have been taught, may not be for him to speak every single thing that we are supposed to do to us, but maybe God's intention just might be that we as Adam would grow in wisdom. That we would learn who God is, what God desires, that we would become like him and then we would act like him. Without having to spend hours in prayer, God, what is your will? I just don't know your will. What is it I need to know before I move? I'm not doing anything until I hear from God. Well, you're going to be sitting there for a long time. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be negative. There are times we hear from God, and those are precious and beautiful moments. But those times are much less than the times where God just expects you to go be his image. Should I help this person? Don't pray about it. Do it. But I don't know what they're going to... I have to pray for discernment. <laughs> trust. Do the right thing because it's who you are and trust that God will take care of the rest of the story. This is going to sound really sacrilegious, but this is a balancing statement. For those who are listening, who have been conditioned that life is to be spent in your prayer closet, I would say this, pray less, do more. That's a balancing statement. I'm not saying pray less. I'm saying if all you're worried about is being before the Father, which is a great place to be, Mary and Martha, praise God. All, all, what I'm saying is God's not going to move you he gave you a brain and he gave you a will. And you know what? If we're his children, God even gave us the very desires of our heart. So if you want something, if you feel something, go get it. Because it's God's desire placed in you. And we haven't gotten any scripture yet. Genesis 12. Um, we're just going to run through. I'm going to try to kind of high step it through some of these things. Um, because I want to get to the Akedah if we have time today. And if not, we'll get to it next week. So we're in Genesis 12. And again, like I said, I keep wanting to move on and I go back and find stuff. I don't want you to miss any of this because the more familiar you get with reading Scripture in a contextual, a contextual sense, the more the story just continues to grow and continues to grow and continues to grow. So verse 1 says, Adonai said to Avram, Get going from out of your land and from your relatives from your father's house and to the land that I will show you. Now, we don't realize what a big deal that statement is. Your father's house. House, father. Get out from your father's house. In ancient Eastern cultures, everyone, or if, hopefully, if you're fortunate, everyone is a part of a Beit Av, a father's house. If you're already thinking gospel-y stuff, just hang on a second. A Beit Av, the father's house, where the, the father, the patriarch, 
provides for your physical needs, food, clothing, shelter. But also the Father has a, a, a legacy that he is, he, is, he is passing on. He has a mindset. He has a way of thinking about life and about things that he is passing on to those that are members of his Beit Av. You ever notice how in, in, in the, the Tanakh, but also in the, in the, uh, in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, how entire households convert? Like the patriarch turns to God and then everybody in the household. Does that mean that every single person in a, in a family of maybe 100 people understood what was going on? Do you think they all really like, it was like, it was revival swept through that household? No. No, it didn't. <laughs> but because this structure is all about the father, if the father turns to the left, everybody in his Beit Av turns to the left because it's all about him. Talk about patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, it was. And it's not really a bad thing. Because not only, it's not that the father gets the authority to call all the shots, but he's responsible. That weight we talked about, about responsibility and authority. Authority with no responsibility is illegitimate authority. Responsibility with no authority is illegitimate responsibility. Either one of those sides you end up with a person that is absolutely miserable and the people around them. So when, when, these, when these patriarchs turn and their whole house turns to God, it's not because revival swept through the house. It's because they're following the patriarch. And they will learn as he learns. He will teach as he learns. He will disciple as he learns. There's a, the, the, this thing about Avram leaving his father's house. There's a great midrash about it in Jewish midrash that talks about the night before Avraham left. Because what is, what's his dad's name? Anybody remember? Terah. Very good. And his, his father was a, his father did what? What was his, what did he do making a living? He made idols, right? He was an idol maker. So the midrash says that the night before Avram left, Terah's house he went in his room and he smashed all of the idols except for one and he he, he put a, a knife or a hammer however you could in, in that idol's hand and the next morning when Terah woke up he went into his idol room and he said what happened and Avram was like that idol smashed all the other idols and Terah says, that's not possible. I made them myself with my own hands. And Avram says, then why do you worship them? I don't know if that's true, but that's awesome. How many times do we worship things we've made with our own hands? Situations we've made with our own hands and then we are bound to them we're locked into them we're in bondage to them you made it you can unmake it so leaving the Beit Av is a huge deal we talked about Sarah and Iska all, we talked about all that stuff verses 7 and 8 of, um, of chapter 12 then I don't know I appeared to Avram and said I'll give this land to your seed stop don't read on what happens the last time? Remember the last story we just came from? What happened the last time a bunch of people got a land? Shinar, Bavel, what happened? They built a tower to make a name for themselves, right? So when you read as a good Eastern reader, which we're not, we're Westerners, and we don't read good, what, when you hear God says, I'm gonna give you a land, you should be thinking, no. Because what is Avram going to do with this land if we know anything about the biblical story? He's going to build a tower and make a name for himself. Read on in the verse. What does it say Avram did? He built a what? He built a tower of a whole different kind. He built an altar. 
I love them. And you're supposed to read these two stories against each other so that you can see what Abraham really is doing or what the narrator is telling you about his life. He builds an altar, but not only does he do that, what does he do next? He builds an altar, and from there he moved. He moved. That's a good thing, right? Yeah, he moved to the mountain. So he started at a tree. He built an altar there. Then he moved to the mountain. The tree at the altar, what does that sound like, a story we just read? Where have we heard this before? Remember Rabbi Foreman's game? Where have we heard this before? Tree and altar. Where have we heard, just hear that? Noah. So he moves there, moves from there, and goes to Bethel, to a mountain. And what does he build there? A city. I knew it, a city, see? No, what does he build? A tent. Ah. Oh. Abraham, he knows what's up. Do you see the difference? God, God banish, or, or disperses Bavel, and Abraham is this new Adam. See, we're coming back to the garden. Go, Abraham. It's awesome. Verses 12 and 13. I love this. <laughs> They go down to Egypt. Now, we love to throw Abraham under the bus for going down to Egypt. Oh, man. Almost had it. If he'd have just trusted God, he'd have stayed in the land. Whew. Let you who was without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> See, this is why I'm, uh, I, well, this is what's been so healing for me is and I want to correct a statement that I said last week is this thing that God that God called Avram Avram's in covenant he's doing a good job he's leaving the house he's taking the barren wife because he cares about her name and her brother's name his brother's name over his own Avraham's checking all the boxes this is the Zadik a righteous one this is what we want to see this is this is the seed that Hava was promised and then he goes into Egypt what, did, what are some things that God promised Abraham? Because this is going to be really important throughout the story as we kind of jump through these real quick. What did God promise Abraham? Okay, nation, which is people, right? right? Through a child, right? A nation, what else? Land, one more thing. Anybody can think of it? It's real quick. Possessions. Possessions. And a name. So really five things. So we've talked about kind of the name already, right? We haven't gotten to the child yet. We haven't gotten to the people yet, the nation yet. We're going to talk about possessions first. So Abraham is in the land, right? He knows God told him just a few verses earlier, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a man of possessions, right? I'm going to bless you greatly with wealth. Cool. You sent me to this place, God, there ain't nothing here. It's dead and dying. So Abraham is standing at an etz da'at. He's standing at a tree. Am I going to trust God's wisdom, or am I going to decide for myself how this is going to happen? And it's just the way I play this out in my mind. This is not necessarily all in Scripture, but just go with me here and see if it doesn't kind of make sense. So verse 11, we'll actually start in 11. So as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, look, I know that you are an attractive woman. So when the Egyptians, everybody say Egyptians, when the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife, and they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. Please say you are my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake. We don't ever read that phrase. For your sake. And my life will be spared because of you. So we have this hero, Avram, and he's left his father's house. He's married the barren woman. He's built altars instead of towers. He's got a tent instead of a city. Avram's got it going on. Avram's doing well. He's, this is the new Adam, man. We got it. Restoration is coming. And then he moves out of the garden, out of the promised land, and then he lies. 
But wait, there's more. Before, uh, before we throw Avram under the bus, Avram was promised possessions. Now what happens in an ancient patriarchal cu uh, uh, culture? You have someone in your bait of that is to be married or is ready to be married. What happens? You get suitors, right? And those suitors bring with them a bride price, right? Avram standing before the tree. Are you going to trust God to bless you? Or are you going to go do it yourself? So in my opinion, Avram and Sarai hatch a plan. Listen, you're really hot. The Egyptians are going to really dig you. Let's go down there and we'll say you're my sister. Now, does anybody's translation have anything different than sister? Okay, several uh, translations, including the new NIV, say close relative, which is actually the word used there. Not sister technically, close relative, which she is. It's going to be important later because we're going to talk about another usage like this. Hopefully. They'll treat me well for your sake. Listen, we're going to hit the jackpot. All these, who? Egyptians, right? Egyptians are going to come and court you. We're going to make off like bandits. Look at God. <laughs> right? Let's keep reading. See, wait, before we do, I can't. I've said this several, several, several times, and I, I, I just... Christianity tells us, and I learned this from an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, Christianity tells us that when God promises you something, you wait for it to fall out of the sky. When, when a Jew hears God promise something, they take that as the call to action. Go make it happen. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to get to work. Not I'm going to bless you. I'm going to sit here and wait. You see, there's a difference in mentality. God said, you'll plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. So what did the Jewish people do? They went and fought wars and took back the land so they could plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. They didn't wait for vineyards to magically fall from the sky and God to make a way where there seemed to be no way. They went and did it. It's a call to action. So where do they get that idea? From Avram. God said, I'm going to make you a man of wealth of many possessions. All right, well, I got to go make it happen then. Now, there's a balance there, okay? I'm, I'm not saying one way or over the other. I'm saying there's two ends of the spectrum. We need to find wisdom in the middle. So the Egyptians will look at you, and they'll, they'll say, man, what can we offer you? And there's going to be a lot of competition, right? So when Avram, verse 14, when Avram came to Egypt, the Egyptians did see that the woman was very beautiful, uh-oh, verse 15. Who also saw she was beautiful? Uh-oh. Boop-boo. If Avram is the patriarch, and he's got the, the woman that everybody wants to court, who has the upper hand? He does. He holds all the cards. When Pharaoh wants her, now who's got the upper hand? Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh doesn't negotiate. Pharaoh takes, then he negotiates. So Abraham's plan, in a sense, backfires, and things are not looking good. See that when you stand before the tree of the Etzda'at, the tree of knowledge, and you choose to do things your own way, did this decision, I said last week that God followed Abraham into Egypt. That was a stretch. But did this decision throw Abraham out of the will of God? There are consequences 
There are natural consequences because the wrong person had an eye for her. Whoopsie. Didn't see that one coming, did you, Avram? Natural consequences. And so the plagues and the this and that. Okay. So if we read chapter 13 so Avram went from Egypt he and his wife and everything that belonged to him and lot with him to the Negev now Avram was very rich in livestock silver and gold and he proceeded proceeded by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been when at the beginning Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar they had made there at first and then Avram called the on the name of Adonai. Now, if you're thinking, well, okay, I'm not sure you got this whole thing right with Abraham doing a scheme and then Pharaoh, and I'm not sure if I'm following you here. It says that he went to the place of Bethel where he had been before, right? Can we find in Scripture where he was there before? Yeah, it's in chapter 12. So you have he was at Bethel here in chapter 12, and then you find him going down to Egypt, coming back, and he's at Bethel here in chapter 13. Those are bookends, remember? What do you call that when you have two bookends in a narrative? Chiasm, right? So that means if there's a chiasm, there has to be a center, right? What's really interesting about this is that you have Abraham leaving Bethel, going to Egypt, and then going back the exact same way, right? Reverse reverse directions there's there's he uh, in, in verse 8 um he's at bethel he comes back and goes the same he says um tells uh, sarai and you can just read through this i'm not gonna have the verses particularly uh say you are my sister and then on the other side of the chiasm pharaoh says why did you say she is my sister right uh it says um what are some others uh let's see uh buddy buddy buddy, buddy. um uh they'll you're beautiful and then on the other side, it says, they saw she was beautiful. You have, you have these, these mirroring phrases, and this is an easy chiasm to find, because when you read that verse, and you read it again a couple of verses later, you go, wait, I read this before. That's a chiasm, okay? It's mirroring both sides of the story. What is the center? The center is verses 14 and 15, which we, which we just read. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians did see and Pharaoh's officials, and she was taken into Pharaoh's house. That's the center of the chiasm. Why is that so important? Because Abram's plan fell apart. If it would just been the Egyptians, it would have been fine. But it went to the top. So this is a tree of knowledge experience. The question is, the question that we have to come out of this story with is what does Abraham learn from this? What is he going to do with that knowledge? Is God supernaturally changing Avram's heart along the way? Or is he working in partnership with Avraham and expects Avraham to learn wisdom as he makes mistakes and fails and makes mistakes and fails, developing Avraham in the walk of wisdom. It's also interesting that when he comes back to Bethel, he builds an altar and calls on the name of the Lord. We see that in Genesis 4, 26. So if we read further down in chapter 13, read 5 through 17, we have the story of Lot, a lot, and Abraham and dividing the land. We won't take time to read it, but... Well, yeah, we will. I'm sorry. Chapter 13, verse 5. Now Lot, who was going with Avram, also had sheep and cattle and tents so that the land could not support them living together because their possessions were many and they were not able to stay together. 
So there was a quarrel between the shepherds of Avram's livestock and the shepherds of Lot's livestock. And then there's a phrase here. The tree of life has it in parentheses. Now the Canaanites and Perizzites were living in the land. Huh? Yeah, it's just kind of like, we'll just stick this in here. What? What does that have to do about anything? Where have we heard this before? We heard it earlier in the last chapter when we were talking about Abraham coming into the land initially. Abraham came down in the Canaan, and it says, in parentheses, the Canaanites were living in the land. Okay. Thanks. I just, I just put that back in my memory in case it comes up again later. Oh, look, it just did. Verse 8, so Abram and Lot said, please let there be no strife between me and you, between my shepherds and yours, since we are relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Please separate yourself from me. If to the left, then I'll go to the right, and the right, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the whole area surrounding the Jordan was well watered entirely. Another parenthetical statement. Before Adonai destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like Adonai's garden. Like Adonai's garden. Hmm, what garden would that be? Like the land of Egypt till you come to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself the whole area surrounding the Jordan, and Lot journeyed where? Oh, that's never a good sign. Dum, dum, dum. You know that's, it's not good. And they separated from each other. Avram dwelled in the land of Canaan. Lot dwelt in the cities of the valley. And he moved his tent from place to place near Sodom. But the people of Sodom were evil, very great sinners against Adonai. And Lot separated himself from him. Adonai said to Avram, now lift up your eyes. Where has Avram been looking this whole time? <laughs> I don't know, but maybe at his feet. I don't know. But then Hashem tells him, open up your eyes. So in the last section, we talked about Avraham's struggle over possession. Is God going to give me possessions, or am I going to have to go and make them myself? And what kind of consequences follow that? Here we're dealing with the land. What has Avram learned from his last encounter? God said he was going to bless me with the land and it's going to be, you know, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. Look, Lot, I'm the patriarch here. I get to choose. I want the good land. How is that different than the last story we read? No. No. You know what, Lot? You choose. I don't know how God's going to do it, but I'm trusting the story. I'm trusting what he said. Abraham is learning how to follow God in wisdom. Land, but also, let's just read just a few more verses. Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are to the north, south, and east, and west. For all the land you are looking at, I will give you your seed forever. I will make your seed like the dust of the earth. Okay, get up and walk about the land. We talked about that word midhalak. is the same word as in uh, the Garden of Eden when God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. So what is the reason that Lot is with Avram in the first place? Why? Why bring Lot? Why? Stop mumbling. Tell me. Right. He's responsible, right? Because Lot's father. But wait a minute. Avram's brother died, right? Who's still the bait of of that family? Terah. So is Avram responsible for Lot or is Terah responsible for Lot? Oh. So why is Lot with Avram? Maybe Terah died. Why else? Could be. Abraham knew Sarah was barren, yet he was promised a child. How are you going to get a child, Avram? Well, it's got to come from my family. Lots is hope. But he's standing before an Ed's Da'at. Am I going to do this my way? Or am I going to let God do his way? And so he tells Lot, I'm going to give you up. Take whatever land you want. 
What is he saying when he lets Lot go? I'm trusting. God will provide it another way. I don't know how. But God will provide it another way. I'm up here in this craggy old rocky mountainous hard terrain because you chose the best. I don't know how God's going to give me a land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm trusting. You were my only way to a son from my own family. But I've learned my lesson. This is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm going to send you away and let you go. Let's go to Genesis 14. Verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Avram, this is after the, ba- the valley of King, battle in the Valley of Kings, right? Where he miraculously takes 318 of his household. That's a big bait off, by the way. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a guy in here? Can you imagine supporting 318 people? Chew Some of us are only raising two or three kids, and we look like we're half dead most of the time. Verse 21, then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. Y'all, but Abram said to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand in an oath to Adonai. Now we've studied oaths in Torah, and we know, whoa, serious business. El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, not a thread or even a sandal strap of all that is yours I will take so that you will not say I've made Avram rich. Man, what a drastic change from, hey, Sarah, we're going to go down into Egypt, and we're going to rob these fools for all they're worth. Do you see the growth and the wisdom of Avram and the character of Avram? Are, are we, are you and I exhibiting this same trajectory of growth? Are we going around the mountain, as the saying says? Are we making the same old mistakes over and over and go, why don't you deliver me, God? Stop making dumb mistakes. Verse 24, I claim nothing but what the young men have eaten and share the men who went with me. Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their share. Okay. (laughs) So, where is Lot living at this time? Sodom. What does the king of Sodom say he wants back? The people. Give me my people, which includes who? Lot. So not only does Avram give Lot up once, but he's given a second chance. He stands at the tree again. How, this is why this is so important to me. If this chair would hold me, I'd stand up on it. This is why this is so impactful to me. Because how do we judge if we're in God's will or not? I mean, just throw me, some, throw me some things. How do we judge if we're in God's will or not? Circumstances. Thank you. I don't need any other answers. Circumstances. I mean, yeah, we try to feel, we try to follow peace, we try to follow shalom. Wherever there's peace, we try to follow, and we try to, that's a good gauge as to whether we're where God wants us to be or not. But most of the time, we look around, and we go, well, things seem to be going pretty well here, this must be God making a way. Well, if it happens again, I'll know. I'll know it's God. Come on, y'all don't act all sanctified. Avram gives up Lot, his only chance for an heir, a promised heir. Abraham's not being selfish saying, I want a kid. He gave up his chance to have a kid when he married the barren woman. God's the one who who changed Abram's expectation. God's the one who said, I'll give you a kid. So Abraham's not treating God like a celestial Santa Claus. He's just saying, you said it. So he gave gave Lot up once, but then he has a chance again. How many of us would have said, I gave him up once. He's come back. This must be God's will. Get, our, get your heads out of the clouds and stop being so super spiritual and let's just be real. We read circumstances like tea leaves. 
I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying let's identify with what's going on. Instead of throwing Avram under the bus or celebrating him for stuff that he didn't know he was doing or whatever we think about it, let's live where Avraham is. We read the circumstances like tea leaves as a, according to God's will, what's God's will in our life. Lot comes back. The king says, give me all my people. What does he do? Standing before the tree, the etz da'at, you got a decision to make, Avram. He sends Lot back a second time. What growth. What, what growth in faith and in wisdom in following the heart of God. There's something else interesting in this passage. Lot's, uh, I'm sorry, Avram said, we said like we saw the, Can- uh, the Canaanites were in the land. Oh, where did we see that before in the, in the last story, right? Uh, in, in the, when, he, when he and Sarai were in uh, going down to Canaan. I'm sorry, la- not the last chapter, in chapter 12. Um, so that's one phrase that ties those two stories together, right? That phrase ties those two stories. There, it's almost like somebody came back later and edited the story and put in markers for you to go, hey, these two stories are meant to be read together. <laughs> Oy. But there's another theme that links these two stories together. In chapter 14... Uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm trying, it's chapter 13. Um, verse 8. Avram says to Lot, let there be no strife between me and you, between your shepherds and mine, since we are brothers. Some will say relatives. Same word there as in chapter 12. Say you are my sister, close relative. Let us not quarrel because we're Brothers, are they brothers? No, not technically. They're close relatives, they're not brothers. Just like in chapter 12, he and Sarah are not sisters. These two phrases, the, the story's wanting you to read these two stories together. The Canaanites were in the land, you are my brother, you are my sister. That's how we can connect these two things and see the progression of Abraham. I want you to understand the method that I'm using to get to, get to where I am. Reading Lot and the story of picking the land against the story of Sarai shows you that growth between in, in Abraham's life. The fact that he and his brother are standing in a field and they're arguing. Where have we heard this before? Cain and Abel, standing in a field and arguing. Out of one came death, because Cain was standing at the tree and he chose his own way. Out of this story comes life, because Avram is standing at the tree and he chooses good. Restoration. All so, so as we close up, what's the so what in this lesson of why reread Genesis the way we did? Because if you don't read Genesis the way we've been reading it, you miss all of, you've never seen any of this your entire life. Because we don't read it through the lens of creation, choice, exile, restoration recreation, new creation. Abraham is the man. He's the Adam, the new Adam we've been waiting for. So next week we're going to pick up in chapter 15. We're going to do chapter 15, 16, and then we're going to jump over to chapter 21 and get into the Akedah because I didn't get to it today, but I want to get to it because the, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, is 
what I heard, the, I think the Bible project called it dismantling the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, dismantling the tree. And I want to take the time to go through that really detailed with you because I, want, I hope that you are learning when you read Scripture, I hope these phrases and stuff are starting to jump out at you. Oh, tree, oh, mountain, oh, water, oh, you know, all these things are starting to jump out at you that you can see the parallels. It all goes back to Genesis. We're reading it with a, uh, a Genesis lens. So thanks, everybody, who joined us um, by live stream. I hope you have a, a great rest of the Shabbat. And uh, let me pray for uh, you before we leave and, and for us. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father in heaven. Father, we, we are so amazed at your word. And, and I know that, Father, some of the questions we ask and some of the the things that the topics we talk about and some of the things that we are exploring our curiosity may be deemed as by some as as heretical or blasphemous or but father i i just want to take a moment to say thank you i i have never been more in love with you your word your messiah than i am in this day in this moment i've never had more of a, a hunger and a curiosity and a thirst for who you are than at this very moment. And Father, I pray that, that we would all be encouraged to be children, to be curious, to, to poke and to prod and to explore and to tear apart, to, to ask questions and, and, and to really seek to know who you are. I pray for our live stream family that you bless them the rest of the Shabbat with peace. I pray, Father, that as we in, in our fellowship um, make Kiddush in just a moment and then eat together, it be a refreshing and encouraging time of fellowship and love and support. We bless you, our Father and our King, above all, and we thank you for this time together. Through Yeshua, our Messiah, for your name's sake. Amen.